Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore nuzlocke of Let's Go Pikachu, using only Pokemon that Ash has used in the anime. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. So Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee are pretty dumb games. For one, they're literally for children. I mean, all Pokemon games are for children, but these ones are more for children, you know? Many of the more complex parts of Pokemon have been stripped from Let's Go, including abilities, held items, effort values, fun. Instead, Let's Go emphasizes catching Pokemon, and specifically catching a lot of Pokemon, which is the exact opposite of what you do in Nuzlocke's. Additionally, you can no longer fight wild Pokemon, you can only catch them. Which is not great, because the experience mechanisms have also been tweaked such that you get a lot of experience from catching Pokemon, and not much from the few trainer battles throughout the game. Since Nuzlocke rules obviously prevent me from catching a bunch of Pokemon, it's nearly impossible to grind experience in this game, meaning I'm going to be pretty underleveled for a large part of this playthrough. There's one exception to this that I'll address when we get to it, but for now, let's just talk about the Pokemon that we'll be using in this playthrough. Ash has used a lot of different Pokemon throughout his ageless transcontinental journeys, Although his most famous Pokemon like Pikachu, Squirtle, Bulbasaur, and Charizard come from his initial journey through Kanto, he also caught a handful of Kanto Pokemon when he was in the Orange Islands, and in his most recent globetrotting adventures in Pokemon Journeys. I haven't actually watched Pokemon Journeys, but apparently he has a Dragonite, a Gengar, and a Lucario on his team now. Respect. For the sake of our challenge, all these additional Pokemon will be fair game. Specifically, if Ash has at any point had the Pokemon, or the evolution of that Pokemon on his team, then I can catch it. However, if Ash did not evolve the Pokemon, then I cannot evolve the Pokemon. So for example, I can catch a Pidgey and evolve it, because Ash caught a Pidgeotto that ultimately evolved into a Pidgeot. And while I can catch a Bulbasaur, I can't evolve it, because Ash never evolved his Bulbasaur, because he's a weenie. This final list of eligible Pokemon comes straight from Serapy. There's a few on here that are basically technicalities since Ash only really had them for like 3 minutes, but for the sake of team diversity, I'm including them. Feel free to complain in the comment section. As you can see, there are some pretty solid options across the board, so we'll be able to construct a pretty good team. However, I decided to add one extra rule to this challenge, which is that Pikachu has to remain on my team for the entire playthrough. That just feels right for an Ash Ketchum playthrough. So without further ado, let's get started. Quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Clause, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, let's go. Get it? I start my journey like Ash did, by meeting up with Professor Oak to get my starter. Unlike Ash though, I'm respectful of my elders and I show up promptly on time. But Oak still gives me a Pikachu as my starter. I name him Amolga Clone. And here we have our first example of why Let's Go is a stupid game for babies. This starter Pikachu is no ordinary Pikachu. It has significantly buffed stats. Here's a regular Pikachu's base stats, and here's our starter Pikachu's base stats. Our Pikachu also has perfect IVs, it can learn a bunch of really broken moves like Zippy Zap, which always crits and always goes first. Oh, and he'll also often just decide to avoid attacks because his bond with you is so strong. Actually, all of your Pokemon can do this, they can randomly dodge moves out of friendship. Sometimes they'll cure themselves of status ailments or survive moves that would normally knock them out. It's really dumb, but there's no way to turn it off, and honestly, this sort of bullshit happens with Ash's Pokemon all the time in the anime, so at least it kinda fits in with our Nuzlocke theme. Anyways, I'm instantly given Pokeballs, so it's time to catch our second team member. I head to Route 1 and I encounter a Rattata. Two things to note. One, Ash did temporarily trade his Butterfree for Eradicate with a gentleman on board the SS Anne. He almost immediately traded it back, but technically Ash owned Eradicate, so this is a legal encounter. And two, as you may have noticed, all the wild Pokemon in this game are overworld encounters. This means that I can kind of choose which Pokemon is going to be my first Pokemon on any route by just avoiding the other encounters, which is a little bit unfair for a Nuzlocke. In a regular Nuzlocke of this game, I'd probably blindfold myself at the start of each route and find a random Pokemon that way. But since we have such few eligible encounters anyways, I'm just going to allow myself to pick which species of Pokemon I get from each route. This is also kind of required for this challenge, because otherwise it would be next to impossible. I'll explain why in a sec. Anyways, I catch the Rattata and name him Not Bidoof. Then I have to return to the lab, where I'm battled by my rival Peanut and his Eevee. 
but a Molga clone takes care of him with a few thundershocks. After that, I head to Route 2 to catch a Caterpie, who I name Green Weedle. Then, I make my way into Viridian Forest, and here's why I have to be able to choose my encounters on any given route. I need a Bulbasaur in Viridian Forest to be able to beat Brock's rock types. Actually, I need a Bulbasaur to even get into Brock's gym. In Let's Go, each gym has a certain entry requirement, and Brock's is that you need to have a grass or a water type Pokemon, so it's absolutely mandatory for me to get a Bulbasaur in Viridian Forest. But Bulbasaur is an incredibly rare spawn in Viridian Forest, and both Pidgey and Weedle are also eligible encounters, so I need to specifically wait for a Bulbasaur to show up as my first encounter. Eventually one does pop up, and I catch him, and I name him Chikorita. From here it's a straight shot to Brock's gym, but since I can't catch any more Pokemon, and there's only a few trainers to fight for experience, I'm pretty underleveled going into this fight. In the anime, Ash wins this fight by turning on the sprinklers, which knocks out Onyx. My victory is going to be a little more noble than that. I lead Chikorita as Brock sends out his Geodude. Two Vine Whips take care of the Geodude, as he just manages to hit a tackle on Chikorita. Then Onyx comes out. And I know Onyx won't go down to a single Vine Whip, and since he's faster, it can probably take me out with two Rock Throws if one of them crits. So I decide to switch to Not Bidoof and sack him to get a clean switch into a Molga clone. A Molga clone hits Onyx with a Tail Whip as Onyx gets a critical hit Rock Throw. I risk a second crit here and go for another Tail Whip. Then it's time for another sack to get a clean switch back into Chikorita. So I switch in Green Weedle, expecting Rock Throw to cleanly knock it out. But somehow, despite a 6 level deficit, Green Weedle survives this attack. And the reason for that is because Onyx has a terrible attack stat. Shockingly terrible. I actually did a whole bit about it in a separate video if you want to check it out. But despite this survival, we still need to sack Green Weedle. So I click String Shot, and then this useless pile of rocks misses a rock throw. Green Weedle lives! He gets off the String Shot, which lowers Onyx's speed, and that allows me to outspeed him with Chikorita. Since Green Weedle clearly wants to live, I decide not to sack him and switch back to Chikorita, who gets hit by a rock throw. On the next turn, a Vine Whip leaves Onyx with a sliver, and another rock throw leaves Chikorita with just one HP. A final Vine Whip knocks out Onyx, winning us the most ruthless first gym battle I've ever had in a Nuzlocke. Sacking Green Weedle was definitely the better play here, because what I did instead left Chikorita vulnerable to a critical hit from Onyx. But I don't care. Green Weedle lives, and he evolves into a Metapod. Here's the aftermath of that battle. Pretty brutal, but that's also by far the hardest gym battle in the entire challenge. After burying Not Bidoof, I make my way towards Cerulean City. On Route 3, I catch a Mankey and name him Harry Macha. In Mount Moon, I run into Jesse and James from Team Rocket. I think it's a nice little touch that they're part of the game, since they're so heavily featured in the anime. Even though they pop up a few more times throughout this game, this is the only fight with them that I'll mention, since they're pretty easy. At the end of this fight though, Green Weedle evolves into Butterfree, which gives us our first fully evolved Pokemon. Once we get to Cerulean City, it's time to take on our rival again. He leads Pidgey, and I lead a Molga clone. He's now learned Zippy Zap, a 50 base power physical electric move that always crits and always goes first, so he knocks out the Pidgey in one shot. Oddish comes out next, and after I hit it once with Zippy Zap, I switch to Chikorita. Oddish and Chikorita trade shots back and forth until Chikorita starts to get a little too low for comfort, because Peanut decided to use a potion. I switch to Green Weedle, who finishes off the Oddish with a Gust. Last is Eevee, who goes down to a Gust from Green Weedle, and then two Zippy Zaps from a Mogul clone. After that, we go straight to Misty's gym and clap her with our overpowered Pikachu. I'm pretty sure in the anime, Ash is just given the Cascade badge, because the gym leader doesn't want to do their job. Honestly, I feel that. In our case, Misty doesn't just give us the badge, but she may as well have. Zippy Zap one-shots Psyduck, and then Starmie comes out. And it actually does survive the first Zippy Zap, but another one finishes it off as she just hits a Molga clone with a Scald. Oh, also I should mention here that critical hits in this generation now do 1.5 times as much damage instead of 2 times. So I was actually safe even if Starmie got a critical hit. A burn, though, that would have been pretty bad. But regardless, that's badge number 2. Next, I circle back to Route 4 to catch a Charmander, which I named Torchic. I then go north of Cerulean City to Route 24 to catch a Squirtle, and I name him Choodle. Soon after, Torchic evolves into Charmeleon. Next, on Route 6, I catch a Pidgeotto, and I name him Bad Firo. Oh, and look, the XP I got from catching Bad Firo is enough to evolve Chikorita. Just kidding, Ash sucks and doesn't evolve his Bulbasaur, so I can't either. Same with Squirtle. 
With Bad Fear on the team, we now have Ash's iconic Kanto team. It's kind of cool, but this team sucks, so this will never happen for the rest of the run. Because the next thing that I do is head to Route 11 and catch a Mr. Mime. Mr. Mime was originally Ash's mom's Pokemon, but in the most recent anime series, it joined Ash's team. So that's why it's eligible for this run. But again, I haven't seen Pokemon Journeys, so feel free to tell me that I'm wrong in the comments. I name her Old Mime Jr. Kinda weird that a Mr. Mime could be a girl, but here we are. Now before we continue our journey, I run into Gamer Hugo on Route 11. In Let's Go, trainers with the Gamer Trainer class will always have a single overleveled Pokemon that knows a single OKO move. In this case, Gamer Hugo has a Diglett with Fissure. So he'll just repeatedly spam that low accuracy OKO move, hoping to knock out all of my Pokemon with random chance. It's actually kind of a clever conceit since the Gamer Trainer class used to be called the Gambler Trainer class, but it's also really terrifying for Nuzlocks. Thankfully, in this case, I can switch to Green Weedle, who is immune to Fissure, and then knock out the Diglett, but I'll need to be really careful to avoid any other gamers. Anyways, next up is the SS A- Oh. Uh. Next is the third rival fight, but it's uninteresting, so let's fast forward to the third gym leader, Lieutenant Surge. In the anime, Ash wins this battle by legit PP stalling Surge's Raichu. It's kinda cool. Our strategy is to just use Dig with a Molga clone. Lieutenant Surge leads Voltorb, and I lead Chikorita to set up a Leech Seed. But Lieutenant Surge manages to paralyze Chikorita with a Thunderbolt, and then Chikorita gets fully paralyzed. Three times. After the third time, my friendship with Chikorita randomly heals the paralysis, but it's a little too late at that point. I switch to Old Mime Jr. and use Seismic Toss once as Voltorb uses Light Screen. Then I switch to a Molga clone and knock out the Voltorb with Dig. Magnemite comes out, but it obviously goes down to a single dig. And last is Raichu, who I outspeed because this Pikachu is busted, and then I hit it with a dig. A Molga clone then dodges a Thunderbolt from Raichu. Again, because our love is so strong or something, I don't know. It should be pretty clear at this point that I'm not gonna lose the run, right? A final dig gives us a cheap victory, though might I remind you that Lieutenant Surge is the one who got three full paras right in a row. After this, we head to Celadon City, and along the way, we encounter a Krabby on Route 10. I name him Corfish. Catching Krabby on this route is actually kind of a mistake, because Route 10 is the only place I can catch Dratini or Dragonair, which are also eligible catches since Ash now has a Dragonite on his team. If you told me as a kid that Ash would have a Dragonite on his team, I wouldn't believe you. But since I caught Krabby here, that means no Dragonite for us. Kind of a mistake, but again, this game basically is just giving me wins, so I think I'm gonna be okay. Speaking of being okay, I accidentally run into another gambler on Route 8. This time it's Gamer Rich and is Sea King with Horndrill. Fortunately, I'm able to put the Sea King to sleep with Green Weedle, switch to a Molga clone, and then knock it out with two Zippy Zaps before it actually connects with the Horndrill. But that could have been really bad. I need to be really careful not to run into another gamer. Oh, f. Okay, Gamer Stan has a Rhyhorn with Horndrill. We'll just do the same thing that we did with Gamer Rich. Hit a sleep pa- well, that's bad. Okay, let's bring out Corfish and hit a Bubble Beam. Bubble Beam won't knock out the Rhyhorn, but it's pretty unlikely that he successfully hits two horn drills in a row. Fuck. Just for fun, let's calculate the odds of this happening. Since Game Freak thought abilities were too complicated for stupid children, Butterfree doesn't have compound eyes, so Green Weedle has a 25% chance of missing Sleep Powder. The chance of Rhyhorn to hit a horn drill with a 10 level advantage is 40%. Then the chance for it to hit the second horn drill with a 9 level advantage is 39%. Let's also add the probability that Corefish doesn't get a critical hit with Bubble Beam, so we're looking at 15 sixteenths. That ends up with a 3.66% chance of this happening. And that doesn't even factor in the random chance in Let's Go for my Pokemon to dodge the attack or hang on with 1 HP, so the actual chances are even lower. Feels pretty bad, but I guess life goes on. After that pretty devastating loss, I make my way to Celadon City. I also backtrack to Lavender Town and fight Peanut in Pokemon Tower, but we'll skip that fight too. Erica and her grass types are next. If I'm remembering the anime correctly, Team Rocket just sets the gym on fire, and then Erica gives Ash the gym badge for helping her put it out. Ash really didn't earn many of his gym badges, did he? Well, I can't set the gym on fire, so instead I decide to lead Torchic into Erica's Tangela. I start with an Ember for about half health. Then I use Smokescreen as Tangela puts me to sleep. 
Then I switch out to Old Mime Jr., who gets hit by a surprisingly hard Mega Drain. Tangela is a bit stronger than I thought. A Psychic is enough to kill out the Tangela though, and then Weepin Bell comes out. But since it's Poison type, a Psychic one shots it. Last is Vileplume, who hangs on from a Psychic and retaliates with a Mega Drain that would have killed me if it's a crit. But it didn't, so another Psychic wins us the gym badge. Up next is Rocket Hideout, culminating with a fight against Giovanni. Normally, this fight is pretty easy, but we're pretty underleveled still, and I don't have many good answers to rock types since Corfish is dead and I can't evolve Chikorita or Choodle. Giovanni leads Persian, and I lead Old Mime Jr. I make sure to protect as Persian goes for a fake out. Then I set up a reflect as Persian hits a hard slash. Next is a switch to Chikorita, who gets hit hard with another slash. I set up a leech seed as Persian just keeps hammering away with slash. Next turn, I put Persian to sleep with sleep powder. Then I start doing damage with Razor Leaf. Persian eventually wakes up and hits a slash as its last bit of HP is drained with Leech Seed. Giovanni's second and final Pokemon is Rhyhorn, which can one-shot a lot of my team. I come up with this brilliant play where I switch to Bad Firo on a drill run, but it ends up being a Mega Horn. So I switch to Harry Machop on the Rock Throw, which misses, and then it's back to Bad Firo as Rhyhorn uses Drill Run. Now I can execute my brilliant play. I use Mirror Move to hit Rhyhorn with his own Drill Run which does like no damage and then Rhyhorn kills Bad Firo with a rock throw. Really living up to your name there, huh? Well, next I bring out Chikorita, who hits a Sleep Powder. On the next turn, a Razor Leaf hits Rhyhorn hard, but Rhyhorn gets that one turn sleep and hits back even harder with Megahorn, which unfortunately knocks out Chikorita. For the record, that is now four of my Pokemon that have been killed by a Rhyhorn. Torchic finishes off the Rhyhorn with a Dragon Rage, which wins us the battle, but our team is looking pretty rough. Thankfully, we've got some solid encounters coming up. First is a Ghastly in Pokemon Tower. Ash used a Haunter in his battle with Sabrina in the original anime, and now has a Gengar on his team in the current series. Unfortunately, I can't do trade evolutions since my online Nintendo membership is connected to a different account than the one that I'm using for this playthrough, so I'm stuck with just a Haunter. Also, this Ghastly has a Brave nature, plus attack, minus speed, which is a really atrocious nature for a Ghastly, so that's disappointing. But for now, it's better than most of my other Pokemon, so not Dusclops joins the team. I also immediately use a Rare Candy on it to evolve him into a Haunter. Shortly after that, Harry Machop also evolves into a Primate. Then we do the whole Pokemon Tower thing with Cubone's mom, which is actually pretty cool and kinda sad. I'm not getting emotional at a game for toddlers, you are. After that, we get the Pokeflute, which means we can wake up the sleeping Snorlax on Route 12, which is an eligible capture since Ash caught a Snorlax in the Orange Islands. Unlike most wild encounters, you have to actually fight this Snorlax, and you have to defeat it in under 5 minutes in order to get the chance to catch it. It's pretty cool actually. Snorlax wakes up and then suddenly gets a plus 1 attack, so I decide to dip because this thing will really mess up my team hard. The other sleeping Snorlax on the other route should get plus defense instead of plus attack, which should be more manageable, so we head over there but not before talking to this lady who can manipulate the nature of the Pokemon we catch. Now, the next Snorlax should have an adamant nature. The second Snorlax wakes up, and we eventually knock it out and catch him. I name him Fat Munchlax, and he joins the team. So here is where this challenge gets a little wonky. In order to challenge Koga's gym, you're required to catch at least 50 types of Pokemon, which is impossible in our current Nuzlocke rule set. So unfortunately, that means the run is over. It can't be done. End of video. Or... I can make an exception. Just this once, I'll go around the map and catch Pokemon until I've gotten 50, but I'll immediately send those Pokemon to Professor Oak, and I won't be allowed to use the candies that I get as a result. This will also help with the fact that we are incredibly underleveled at this point, so at least it saves me from going around and fighting every single trainer on the map. I start by catching the last few eligible encounters that we have left. First, I head to Route 19 and catch a Lapra. It's French. Ash uses a Lapra in the Orange Islands. I name her Big Shellos. Catching Big Shellos also gives us enough experience points to evolve Torchic into Charizard. Then I head to Route 15 to catch a Tauros. Ash actually caught 30 Tauros, but Species Clause means that I'm only going to be able to catch one. I name him Man Miltank. And finally, I head to the Power Plant to catch a Grimer, which I name Wet Trubbish. After I've caught 50 Pokemon, I return to Koga's gym to challenge him. As far as I remember, Ash actually wins this one, no strings attached so good for him. We'll be using Old Mime Jr., who at this point has learned an incredibly broken set of moves. 
Weezing uses Protect as Old Mime Jr. uses Substitute. Next, I use Encore to lock Weezing into Protect. From there, a few psychics take out Weezing as he can do nothing but just use Protect over and over again. Encore is one of the best moves for a Nuzlocke, because the AI will almost never switch out and loves wasting time using random setup moves that you can lock them into. Substitute is also really useful, since it basically guarantees you'll get an attack off and also prevents your Pokémon from being hit by stat-altering moves or status afflictions. This same strategy knocks out Muck. And then after that, Venomoth and Golbat go down to a single Psychic each, winning us the fifth gym badge. Next up is the Sylphco storyline in Saffron City. Wet Trubbish evolves into Muck during this time, but other than that, nothing too exciting happens here. With our new team members, most notably Big Shellos, Giovanni is much easier, so let's just jump straight to Sabrina's gym. Now, unfortunately, in order to get into Sabrina's gym, you need to have a Pokémon that's at least level 45, but Sabrina's ace is only level 44. So I have to intentionally overlevel Big Shellos and then leave her in the box for the gym battle. But that's not a problem, because Old Mime Jr. takes care of her whole team without breaking a sweat. She leads her own Mr. Mime, who sets up a light screen as I use Substitute. And Encore traps her Mr. Mime into using light screen, and then I just start doing damage with Shadow Ball. After a few more turns, I've timed it so that I can knock out her Mr. Mime on the turn that her light screen expires. And from there, it's a sweep. Alakazan comes out and doesn't even manage to break our sub with two psychics. So we knock it out with our sub still intact. Slowbro comes out next and goes down to two Shadow Balls. At least he finally takes out our sub with a Surf. Last is Jinx, who goes down to two more Shadow Balls, winning us the match. That's badge number six. It wasn't as easy as Ash using a Haunter to make Sabrina laugh, but it was pretty close. Next, it's a straight shot to Cinnabar Island and the seventh gym leader Blaine. This is another rare gym battle where Ash actually just wins fair and square, so I've got nothing snarky to say. But here's something I didn't know. You don't get a break between fighting Blaine's gym trainers and fighting Blaine himself. The gym trainers are avoidable, but I chose to fight them for experience, so I'm actually going into this fight without full health. But it's still pretty easy. Blaine leads Magmar, and I lead Fat Munchlax. I switch to Old Mime Jr., who gets hit by a low kick, which does basically nothing. Then I set up an Encore to keep Magmar stuck in the low kick. From here, I start setting up Calm Minds, and I also put up a Substitute. As you can see, this strategy is pretty broken. After setting up enough, a Psychic takes out the Magmar. Rapidash comes out, but it goes down to a Psychic as well. And the same fate awaits the Arcanine and the Nine Tails waiting in the back. Actually, Nine Tails hangs on with a Sliver, but a Fire Blast doesn't even break our sub, so that gets us a very easy 7th Gym Badge. From here, it's time to take on Giovanni one last time as the 8th Gym Leader. You know, I'm not sure who's in charge of deciding who becomes a gym leader in Kanto, but they really need to vet their applicants a bit better. Giovanni is literally a crime lord. I think gym leaders should also probably undergo some sort of yearly review process, because Lieutenant Surge makes 10-year-olds dig through trash before challenging him, and Blaine just straight up locks the door on his gym. But anyways, in the anime Ash actually never fights Giovanni, Instead, he fights Jesse and James as they borrow some of Giovanni's Pokémon. Sadly, that doesn't happen here, so we're stuck with just dumb old Giovanni. He leads Doug Trio, and I send out Torchic. Before the battle, we got the ability to Mega Evolve Torchic, but I'm banning that for my playthrough. Doug Trio uses Slash as I hit a Flamethrower, which crits and leaves it with a Sliver. On the next turn, Doug Trio tries to use Sucker Punch, but I take this time to set up a Reflect. Then, I kill the Doug Trio with a Flamethrower. Rhydon comes out next, so I switch to Fat Munchlax to take a Rock Slide. Rhydon hits an Earthquake as I go for a Yawn. Then, I switch to Old Mime Jr., who gets hit by an Earthquake, which still does a lot of damage through Reflect. But, on the next turn, I set up a Sub on Rhydon's first turn of Sleep, and then set up a Calm Mind. But unfortunately, Rhydon wakes up and hits an Earthquake, breaking my Sub. One Calm Mind isn't enough for a one-shot, so I have to switch strategies here. I switch to Big Shellos, who tanks the Earthquake and then knocks out Rhydon with a Surf. Nitto King is out next, so I switch to Torchic as he goes for a Horn Drill. I intentionally leveled up Torchic to the level cap of 50 for this fight, specifically for Horn Drill. OKO moves don't work on Pokémon at a higher level. Next, I hit the Nitto King with a Will-O-Wisp. Then I switch to Wet Trubbish to take a Poison Jab, and then back to Torchic to avoid the Earthquake. I do this over and over and over again until Nitto King is at low enough health to be comfortably knocked out by a flamethrower from Torchic. Last is Nitto Queen, who I hit with a Will-O-Wisp. Then I set up a Reflect, and then I switch to a Molga clone. 
Another switch to Torchic puts him in the red. For some reason, she didn't use Earthquake. So I switched to Snorlax and hit Nidoqueen with an Ice Punch. A final switch to Torchic on an Earthquake sets up for a kill with Flamethrower, winning us the 8th and final Gym Badge. After this, we need to take on Peanut one more time, but yet again, it's underwhelming, so let's just fast forward to the Elite Four. Our level cap is 55 to match Lance's Dragonite, so I spend a good deal of time running around the map and picking up rare candies. There's a handful of coach trainers that will give you 5 each if you beat them. So after using up all of these, here's our final team. Turns out Ash managed to catch some pretty solid Pokemon. Let's see if we have what it takes to beat the Elite Four. First is Lorelei with her Ice types. She leads Dugon, and I lead Torchic. Lorelei's Dugon is completely physical, so I use Will-O-Wisp for the burn. Then I hit a smokescreen, as Dugon uses another waterfall and puts me in range of a crit. So I switch to Old Mime Jr., who sets up a substitute, as Dugon misses a waterfall. I then proceed to set up four Calm Mines, as Dugon misses almost all of its attacks. I don't know if these misses are because of smokescreen, or just due to Old Mime Jr.'s undying loyalty to me, but either way, it's pretty funny. I knock out Dugon, and then Jinx comes in. Jinx actually does manage to hang on from a Thunderbolt, but then it misses a Blizzard. Our love is just too strong, I guess. Look, I know this is total bullshit, but can't you see something like this happening to Ash in the anime anyways? After Jinx is Cloyster, who obviously goes down to a Thunderbolt. And then the Lapras and the Slowbro also get one shot, and that's Lorelei defeated. Up next is Bruno, who leads with Onyx. A Surf from Big Shellos knocks him out after he sets up Stealth Rock. Polyrath comes out, but I switch to Old Mime Jr. who resists Superpower. From here, it's a clean Psychic Sweep. Oh look! I forgot to teach him Psychic after my fight with Lorelei. That is now the second challenge in a row where I forgot to teach one of my Pokemon Psychic in the Elite Four against the Fighting-type trainer. I swear it's not intentional, I'm just that dumb. But it's also not a huge issue. I encore the Polyrath so that it's stuck using Superpower, and then I set up a Substitute. Then I set up a Calm Mind as Superpower just does progressively less and less damage. Polyrath's encore ends, so I set up another encore, but then the encore instantly ends. I was really confused at the time, but then I realized that Polyrath ran out of Superpower PP, so its encore ended. I probably should have considered that when I was planning for this fight. Well anyways, I hit a Thunderbolt, which leaves Polyrath with a sliver and Polyrath breaks my sub with a waterfall. I set up another sub to absorb a waterfall, and then set up one more Calm Mind. Another waterfall doesn't break the sub either, so it's intact as Polyrath goes down and Machamp comes out. Two Thunderbolts kill Machamp, but now my sub is broken as Hitmonlee comes out. So I switch to Wet Trubbish, who gets hit with a Rock Slide, and then does some big damage with Poison Jab. Hitmonlee then crits the third Rock Slide, and Wet Trubbish flinches. So I switch to a Molga clone who takes care of the Hitmonlee with a Zippy Zap. Last is Hitmonchan who gets hit with a Thunderbolt as he burns a Molga clone with a Fire Punch. Since Hitmonchan doesn't know any fighting moves, it's actually a safe switch into Fat Munchlax who hits a Body Slam on the next turn, finishing off Bruno. I made that way harder for myself than I needed to. But anyways, third is Agatha. She leads Arbok and I lead Torchic. A Will-O-Wisp burns the Arbok before it uses Glare on Torchic. The plan is to lower Arbok's accuracy a bunch, but Torchic gets fully paralyzed twice in a row. On the third term, our magical bond heals Torchic's paralysis, so Arbok goes for another glare, but then that one gets healed too. After this, I switch to Wet Trubbish to bait a crunch. And then I switch to Old Mime Jr., who avoids the crunch. This game is so dumb. I encore Arbok into crunch, and then set up a Calm Mind and a substitute. From here, a single Psychic knocks out Arbok. Look, I remembered to teach it Psychic. Gengar comes out and outspeeds me to break the sub, but then it goes down to a Psychic. Weezing also goes down to a Psychic, and then Agatha's second Gengar comes out. So I switch to Wet Trubbish to bait a Shadow Ball, and then I switch to Fat Munchlax for a clean switch. On the next turn, Sludge Bomb poisons Fat Munchlax, but an Earthquake knocks out the Gengar. And the last Pokemon is Golbat, but a Thunder Punch and then a switch to a Molga clone knocks it out, and that's Agatha defeated. The final Elite Four member is Lance. He leads Seedra. So the plan is to bait a dragon move with Big Shellos, switch to Old Mime Jr., and then set up. But it turns out that Big Shellos baits Hyper Beam. I can still make this work though. First step is to let Seedra hit the Hyper Beam so that I can get a safe switch to Old Mime Jr. I go for an Ice Beam for some small damage, but hilariously, that freezes the Seedra. And then what happens really has to be seen to be believed. 
Cedra stays frozen as I set up a substitute and then six Calm Minds. Including the turn I switched, this Cedra stayed frozen for eight turns. There's a 20% chance to unfreeze every single turn that you're frozen. So the odds of this, including the 10% chance to freeze it in the first place, are about 1.68%. That's hilarious. Obviously the rest of this battle is a complete wash. Psychic one-shots every single one of Lance's Pokemon. The Aerodactyl does outspeed and break the sub, and Charizard outspeeds to hit a weak Air Slash, but that's it. The Elite Four has been defeated. The final fight of the run is against the champion, our rival Peanut. He leads Pidgeotto, and I lead a Molga clone. His Pidgeot can Mega Evolve, but it goes down to a single Thunderbolt from a Molga clone. Pretty underwhelming. Next is Vileplume. I switch to Wet Trubbish as it uses Reflect. We trade Sludge Bombs and Ice Punches for relatively similar amounts of damage until Vileplume decides to go for a Solar Beam. So I switch to Torchic to tank the Solar Beam and then knock out the Vileplume with a Flamethrower. Third is Jolteon, so I switch to Fat Munchlax, who takes a Thunder. He does get paralyzed, but thankfully he still connects with an Earthquake on the next turn, knocking out the Jolteon. Marowak is fourth, so I switch to Torchic and use Will-O-Wisp to burn the Marowak. I switch back to Fat Munchlax to guarantee bait a Brick Break. Then I switch to Old Mime Jr. and lock him into Brick Break with Encore. From here, the battle is over. Burned Brick Break just does so little damage that I can set up as many Calm Minds as I want. I also set up a Substitute. Then, after I'm set up, a Psychic knocks out Marowak. Rapidash comes out next, and it does outspeed to break the sub, but Psychic knocks it out. And then last is Slowbro, who does delay the inevitable a bit by using Light Screen and then a full restore, but a few more Psychics take it out, winning us the battle and the run. Well, that was quite the experience. I can't say it was particularly challenging, save for maybe the very first gym, and I also can't really say that it was that fun. These games are just dumb and they're not meant to be nuzlocked. There wasn't ever really any point where I was worried that I was going to lose, so it made most of the run feel like I was just going through the motions. That being said, at least I got another playthrough out of this $60 glorified remake of Pokemon Go. So there's always that. Plus, it is always fun to watch Pokemon follow you around. But this will probably be my one and only Let's Go Nuzlocke I do, so I hope you enjoyed it. Anyways, if you enjoyed watching this video, please like the video and subscribe. Or, or don't. I don't know, but either way, thanks so much for watching. The amount of support I've gotten after my first few videos is really heartwarming, and I can't thank you all enough for how nice you've been. Let me know what challenges you want to see me do next, and any suggestions you have to improve the channel. My next challenge will be Pokemon Emerald using only normal type Pokemon. After that, I'll be doing a few viewer requested challenges, so look out for all that. And remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.